Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cozy Corner. My name is Lee and this is my library. So grab a mug of something yummy and settle in for some talk of books. It is the end of the month. Today is March 31st, which means we get to talk about all of the books that I read during the month of March. But before we do that, I have the very exciting task of announcing the champion title for Book March Madness, as well as announcing the winner of the giveaway. But before I do that, again, I want to say a huge thank you to all of you who participated in the competition, who helped make it fun. This month went so quickly. Um, and you all continually surprised me and made this an even more enjoyable experience than last year. So thank you so much. I truly appreciate it and I cannot wait to do this again. So without further ado, the winning title of Book March Madness 2022 is Anne of Green Gables. I think it comes as no surprise because towards the end of the competition, uh, Anne was definitely the clear front runner for so many of the competitions. <laughs> So, yay, congratulations, we get to celebrate this amazing champion book as the winner of Book March Madness 2022, and we get to celebrate the winner of the giveaway, who is Kirsten, who is uh, actually a good friend of mine from college who uh, was such an active participant in the competition, and she was selected from our random drawing uh, for those who correctly predicted the winner. So congratulations, Kirsten. I'll be uh, in touch with you soon to get your mailing information, and I will get you uh, your prize package featuring all of those amazing things from the fictional boutique uh, sent to you as soon as possible. Hooray and congratulations! We finished another year of Book March Madness, and I cannot wait to see what next year's competition brings. And without further ado, let's get into the books that I read during March. So March was actually a pretty uh, decent reading month. Um, I remember last year when I first did Book March Madness, I barely read anything because I was so hyper-focused on uh, getting that competition up and running. But this year, because all of the logistics were already worked out, it was so much more fun uh, and I actually had time to read. And so I finished uh, seven books in the month of March and uh, it was also good because I didn't have anything below a three star. Um, which was great. I had quite a few four-star reads actually during the month of March. So let's start with the three stars. Uh, I actually am going to start with uh, an ebook that I read or uh, I checked it out from uh, an online uh, like library app, Libby. Um, that is Timeline by Michael Crichton, I think is how you pronounce his last name. And it is a sort of hybrid between uh, fantasy and sci-fi that follows a team of um, kind of archaeological, uh, historical um, grad students who are all working on this particular uh, abbey slash castle in the French countryside. Um, and their job is to work on uh, like dating and uh, gathering, like dating uh, <laughs> archaeological finds uh, and finding out the background information for things like architecture or uh, lifestyle of the people who lived in that area. That's one set of the story. The other set is this uh, very advanced tech company who is focusing on um, a bit like a uh, wrinkle in time, trying to fold space and time so that people can travel back in time uh, and they can learn more about uh, previous eras of history. Although the owner of this tech company is more uh, lucratively minded uh, and so is viewing this as a way to make money on sending very rich people on uh, vacation. Basically, um, their project is the current archaeological expedition that these historians are working on because this company helps fund their dig. And so by a series of events, um, the professor of these grad students gets taken and sent back in time. And then a few of the grad students also go back to try and rescue him. And it's all very nail biting because there's only a certain amount of time <laughs> to get this done. Um, I gave it three stars um, because one, I thought the writing was great. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, Crichton's voice. It was very distinctive, um, very good at incorporating um, information, historical information uh, about the time period um, and kind of blending that with the narrative of the story. It kind of lost me a little bit. There was, uh, I, I don't really know how to put it into words, but I felt like there wasn't enough in the story. Um, it was very cut and dried as to 
this is the evil presence. This is how they're going to get out of it. And there was no real tension, I felt, uh, necessarily. Um, it, it, I think it lent a little more, leaned a little more towards the academic side rather than the um, pace of the thriller aspect of a fantasy or sci-fi book. Um, so it let me down a little bit on that front, but I still enjoyed it. I think if you really like um, that kind of historical science fiction with some fantasy elements in it, a fantasy as in uh, like knights and that kind of thing, not magic, but um, <laughs> um, sort of the fantastical parts of science development. I think you would really enjoy this book, particularly if you liked things like Jurassic Park. Um, I think that's uh, kind of up your alley if you like those kinds of things. But um, I did read this book um, based off of the uh, 12 books recommended by 12 friends. Um, and so my friend Megan recommended this one to me. Uh, and I'm happy to have read it. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it read really quickly. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to have dipped my toe into someone else's reading tastes. The next three star book that I read this month was uh, The Snow Fell Three Graves Deep by Alan Wolfe. This is a story told in something called narrative pointillism, which I have never heard of before, but I really liked it. Um, this is a story all about the Donner Party uh, and their journey from the Midwest to California, um, like so many uh, in the gold rush, and uh, basically all of the awful stuff that they had to go through, including cannibalism, um, in order to get to California and that promise of new life out there. So narrative pointillism, basically it means that this is a story told from many perspectives using a variety of storytelling methods. So there was poetry, um, uh, narrative, there were um, sort of artistic layout choices of the page that kind of told you um, a little bit about kind of the vibe of the story. So here's an example. Throughout the story, because snow is a huge part of this um, book obviously um they have like names of the people who died like snowflakes um and so it get eventually gets more uh condensed down at the bottom the more people die and it's a really interesting way to look at the timeline um of death but what i really liked um particularly in this book is that we get a uh, part of the story from hunger it's really interesting to read alan wolf's interpretation and say that hunger has no thought it isn't capable of making anyone do anything so it was interesting to read it from Hunger's perspective to say that I am, I exist because humans exist. So therefore humans have control over me. Um, and these are still humans who still made choices. But it was a really interesting perspective to, to think about how much humans push for survival and the lengths they will go to to do that. So um, this was a really interesting story. Um, hard to read, obviously. But I enjoyed it because of the variety in storytelling. I really enjoyed this perspective. It moved quickly. I never felt bogged down by any details. I think um, the only issue that I had was just because it, it didn't feel... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe tangible enough. I think because it moved so much and it was made a little prettier than I think the true situation was. It was very graphic, very visceral, but it it did not sit in the morality of this particular issue, um, and I kind of was expecting that a little bit. Um, I was not as moved as I thought I was going to be by this story. It was, like I said, hard to read, and I really love all the research and information that Alan Wolf did and put into this story, but um, Ultimately, when stuff reads quickly like that, y y I kind of expect the point to be a little more present, but it was just sort of a, a, a prettier narration of what had happened. But uh, I say that knowing this is a, a hard book to read. But if you are looking for um, an interesting take on uh, a big sort of awful historical event like this, I would really recommend this um, because you learn a lot, but also, you know, it almost softens the blow a little bit of the graphic stuff that happens in here. And the third three-star book that I read in March was The Air Affair by Jasper Ford. This is the first installment in the Thursday Next series. I loved this book. <laughs> 
And so I'm sure probably you're wondering, why didn't you rate it higher? That's because it is a series. There are seven in total. I'm currently um, almost done with the second part uh, of the series. Um, and so I just kind of left it at a, a mid-range three star until I'm kind of finished with the series and then I can ultimately decide what I think about all of them. So this is the story of Thursday Next, who is a literatech officer of the spec ops or like police force. Um, and basically literatechs uh, handle all crime related to literature, which is just, it sounds like the best job. Um, and so in this book, Thursday is chasing the villain Asheron Hades as he travels into books um, and kills off characters as sort of wanton crime because he can um and so it's her story of chasing after him um and there's so much more that happens in these books but literally they're so convoluted that you you have to read them so this takes place in the 80s 1980s but it's an 80 in 1980s that's sort of caught out of time the crimean war is still happening um winston churchill doesn't exist you know there it's just so disjointed in the most cohesive way um, so much happens in this book. It's funny. Um, even me, who reads a lot, yes, but doesn't necessarily consider herself well-read necessarily, I picked up so many of the references and jokes in this book. The names in this book are so funny. <laughs> um, it's just uh, such a delightful romp through literally every literature reference you're ever going to get. Um, and the second one is equally as good, um, very different story, but it's, it's so good. And I've had a few people who've reached out to me who said that they were lost and confused, uh, in these books. And I can fully see why, because literally every sentence has a reference in it somewhere. And if you don't know what it is, it can get a little confusing. So you almost have to kind of turn off that part of your brain to read the story. And then when a reference happens that you know, you're like, hey, <laughs> I got that one. But I think overall, Jasper Ford really is just the kind of author that I love, where it's a serious story, but told in such an acerbic and witty way that you almost forget that you're dealing with a cold-blooded murder villain, you know, who he's just so charming. Um, <laughs> I love Thursday as a main character. I think she's an incredible protagonist. Um, you get a little her backstory in there and the trauma that she's gone through. Um, this is a relatively short book, you know, it's average, just over 350 pages, but it read so quickly. Um, one of the things that I think I like most about this is that at uh, the beginning of each chapter, you get kind of a, a summary description about what's going to happen in the chapter from one of the characters based on a work that they've written. So like you get Thursday next uh, private diary entries from interviews, you get characters excerpts from books that they've written. It's just, it's just sort of the perfect combination of anything book related crammed into uh, a police detective story. It was so good. And moving on to the four star books. So uh, one of the four star books I read in the month of March, I actually don't have with me, it was a library book, um, but it was uh, Stamped from the Beginning, A History of Racist Ideas in America by Ibram X. Kendi. I started this book in February, I think, uh, the beginning of February, I think that's right. I've been working on it for a while. <laughs> actually, I think it was in January. Um, yeah, in this, uh, book is exactly what it sounds like. It is a definitive history of uh, racist ideas in America. Um, I read the adult version, um, as in for adult readers, and uh, it, it was encyclopedic. There was so much information, so much history covered um, that, you know, it felt like three years of history classes in one book, and I, in the best way possible. Um, I wish that I could pick one thing necessarily that stuck out to me, but to do that I think would limit the book. Basically, the premise of this, uh, Ibram X. Kendi said in his introduction that this book is not for changing people's minds about racism. Um, because, you know, until they decide to do that themselves, we can't really do that. This book is for people who want to learn, who want to be educated about 
um, systems that you may unknowingly be supporting um, or to learn more about the alternative history that we're never told. For people who want to educate themselves, that's who this book is for. And I really appreciated that um, little nugget of honesty at the beginning, um, as well as him admitting, um, because he is a black man, that even as he was writing this book, he was learning about what he himself, uh, as a black man, had been believing that was actually a racist idea. Um, and so no one is impervious to this line of thinking. And it really changed um, how I viewed several things um, and how I thought about many things in terms of um, race identity and the damage that that can inflict, but also, you know, the smaller ways in my life in which I lean more towards those ideas rather than recognizing where they came from. Um, currently, like one of the ones that stuck with me the most at the moment was uh, the history of standardized testing um, and where that started <laughs> as a way to determine whether one race was smarter than the other, which they aren't, um, and how that's still being propagated. And now people don't like uh, standardized testing because it's not a fair way to <laughs> analyze anyone's education or intellect. <laughs> um, so it was a, a, a read that was necessary and I would recommend it again to anyone who is looking to learn more um, about what it means to be anti-racist. Um, I am curious and I know several people are going to read it because he came out with a youth version. I think it's James Reynolds who's the co-author. Um, I would be curious to see how he adapted the massive over, I think it's like, how many pages, like 700 some pages of uh, uh, stamped into a youth version. And I think there's a kid's book also. Um, I would love to read them uh, and hopefully I will in the future. But if you have read the youth version or the children's book version, let me know because I'm very curious to uh, know how they read as well. But I would recommend set aside a decent amount of time um, because it's not a book that you can read easily in a month. Um, it, it will take some time to uh, sit with, let alone get through. So well worth the read, well worth the four stars. Um, yeah, I would recommend it to anyone. Moving on, another four star book. I finished uh, the 100 Cupboard series with The Chestnut King by Andy Wilson. I'm so glad that I finally finished this trilogy. It has been sitting unfinished on my shelves for so long. Um, I loved The Chestnut King. One of my favorite things uh, in fantasy books particularly, but in any book really, is the reestablishment of family for someone who thought they lost theirs. Um, and it doesn't really matter what it looks like, but I particularly like the trope where they are family members that are very distant um, or had to leave behind a child for a particular reason. And getting to see the reestablishment, the rebuilding of trust, the um, connections being made, and you knew that uh, Henry's parents were somewhere. And so about the middle of Dandelion Fire, did you realize that they were somewhere and now they were fighting to get back to him and Henry was fighting to find them? I love that element. Um, just found family in here is so good. Um, I've mentioned before when I've talked about these books that sometimes the magic system was a little inaccessible. Um, I was curious as to why this would be labeled middle grade, but I get it. You know, it's all about preteen, teenager kids. Um, there's, you know, very little romance. There's not anything that we would attribute necessarily to adult fantasy, but the magic was still just a little out there, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> um, maybe I would have thought differently had I read this younger, but um, that was really one of the bigger things that didn't make me give this a five stars. It's still an incredibly original series and I, I really, really, really loved it. Um, I love the emphasis of nature. Um, I love the very unique types of characters in here. Um, the good friendships made. It's, it's such a good story and this is the kind of story that I would want to read aloud to kids and maybe I will one day. Um, it's, it's that kind of story, that kind of legend-based story that just, I think, would be really good uh, for kids to hear read to them. So, 
I'm so glad that I finished it. I'm definitely 100% keeping this series <laughs> because I love it so much. And now I have the prequel. I get to hear uh, the originating of uh, Henry's parents, which is just so cool. So um, I would recommend this if you love middle grade, something a little out of the box. It's so good. Next on my four star list is All About the Story by Leonard Downey Jr. This is one of his many memoirs. Um, Leonard Downey Jr. Uh, was the longest editor of the Washington Post, a newspaper here in America. And this is um, a bit like the Walter Cronkite story I read a few years ago, um, his summary of the events that had happened. It is less opinionated um, than Walter Cronkite's. Um, it's more supplying background information rather than his opinions, but it covers um, things. Okay, I gotta go back and look at the table of contents. It covers um, his early life, him becoming an accidental intern at the Washington Post. Um, it covers Watergate, Deep Throat, uh, Unabomber, Jonestown, um, him being a foreign correspondent in London, the Charles and Diana story, uh, Bill Clinton and his um, uh, scandal with Monica Lewinsky. It covers uh, Nixon also in the White House. It covers um, the CIA secrets, 9-11, um, preparing for the Iraq war. Um, yeah, like the CIA black sites and his sort of forced retirement when the newspaper was sold. So it's a very cumulative history of his time uh, behind the editor's desk. And I really liked it. I'm discovering that I like these stories written by the people who were so actively involved in news investigation and um, delivery. It's a really fascinating way to read and learn about history because um, Leonard Downey Jr. is very emphatic about the fact that he didn't vote when he was the executive editor because he spent so much time in investigative journalism. It didn't seem fair to him to influence the readership one way or the other by doing that. And so reading about his development of investigative journalism as a career um, and all of the things he brought to the table and how he changed how to be a reporter was really interesting. Um, like I said, it was he was less opinionated than uh, Walter Cronkite, but still very informative. Um, and I loved learning more about the newspaper industry um, and editorials and um, the transition from newspaper to digital media, uh, that kind of thing. So if you want to learn more background information about those big events in history, I really would recommend this book. Um, I'm discovering, like I said, that I really, really like this type of nonfiction where it is a different lens look into big world events. And interestingly, the Walter Cronkite story took you up to about the 60s, 70s, basically right before Watergate. And this book picked up right at Watergate. And so it was a nice little <laughs> sort of bridge between um, CBS News reporting um, and then uh, newspaper reporting uh, into the 21st century. So anyway, very great. Um, love the emphasis, news, power, politics, and the Washington Post would recommend for anybody who really likes uh, historical nonfiction. Hi everyone, sorry if there's a changing in lighting and position of the camera. Um, I had to interrupt my filming because I had piano lessons to teach this afternoon. Um, but I did want to hop on and talk a little bit about um, the last book that I read and then wrap up the video. <laughs> um, apologies if you can hear piano in the background. Um, it's piano practice time in my household at the moment. so. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk about the last book that I gave four stars for the month of March, and that was Rocket Boys by Homer H. Hickam Jr. Um, if you don't know, this is the autobiography that uh, inspired the movie October Sky, and I believe that this book is now published under that same title. But this is the story of Homer Hickam, who um, eventually became a NASA engineer. Um, but this is kind of like his origin story. It follows him in uh, his growing up years in, I think it's Colwood, Virginia. And I don't know why, <laughs> um, but whenever I read a book about Appalachia, I just immediately envision it, it being very um, depressing <laughs> and dark and dismal. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it's because for so many decades it was a very poverty 
focused town um or in town uh area of the united states and i just sort of kind of braced for impact that that's what it's gonna be like um but i actually really enjoyed this and yes that is still part of um, sort of the fabric of this town, Colwood, because it's a coal mining town, coal mining area, and there's union strikes and uh, company politics that force people out of their homes and basically make them penniless. Um, that's a big part of the story, but basically it follows Homer and his group of friends in their adventures in building and setting off rockets uh, in their hopes to, in Homer's case, uh, meeting uh, Werner von Braun, who uh, you know, was sort of one of the front men uh, leading the charge of getting the United States in space after Russia goes first. So um, they're obsessed with space, they're obsessed with rocketry, and so it's the story of them building these rockets and testing them and eventually going to the science fair. It has nothing to do with uh, Homer getting to NASA. There's a brief mention of what happened after this story, but um, it's all about that origin story of growing up in this town, family dynamics, romance, small town life, um, building rockets, sort of coming up from the bottom. But what I really liked most about this book and why I gave it four, stalls, far, four stars, ultimately, uh, is because it didn't read like an autobiography. It read like a novel. It was such good writing. He admits at the beginning that some of this is stretched. Uh, people are combined to make characters. So it is a... Uh, I don't want to say fictionalization, but a colored in autobiography. Um, but it is so good. And I would read for the family dynamics, the small town life, the romance, the growing up, you know, I was reading almost more for that than I was about the rockets. You know, it was, I love the little quip that they put on here from the New York Times. It says a thoroughly charming memoir, an eloquent evocation of a lost time and place. That's really what this is. If you've ever lived in a small town, you know how weirdly, it's such a biome <laughs> of culture and people and way of living that when you get to enter into another small town sort of biome like this, you're like, yeah, I recognize every element um, of this small town life. And it was so interesting to uh, experience that. And it was so, like I said, it was so simply written, but it was so beautiful. And um, I probably won't ever read it again. I am really interested in watching the movie. But um, if you like science, if you love a good memoir, I would really recommend starting with something like this, um, where it's an easier transition from a novel to nonfiction, because sometimes that can be kind of jarring for people. But if you find stuff like this, where you know that these have been made into movies, like there was something there that makes this read like a really good story. Um, and I this book is so not <laughs> uh, what I would typically read and it's part of the reason why I love um, when people give me books, when people recommend me books and I actually take the time to read them because every once in a while I will come across them. One of Some of them that will be like so altering in my perspective of reading because I never would have picked this up of my own volition but I got it as a birthday gift or Christmas gift years ago and I finally pulled it off of my TBR and I'm so glad I read it because it was just such a gorgeous story. Um, you know, it was a great coming of age and it even has picture sections in the middle, which I'm obsessed with. <laughs> I love it when books have that. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, goes to show that, you know, um, a powerful story can reach across taste and genre. So. Um, I would highly recommend this. It's just, oh, it's such a good read. So there you have it. Those are the seven books I read during the month of March and the reveal of the champion book for Book March Madness and my friend Kirsten who won the giveaway. Oh, I'm so excited. Again, a huge thank you to the friends and family who uh, supported me on this journey of putting Book March Madness together. Hello and welcome to the new subscribers who found me through Book March Madness. I'm so glad you're here. I hope you stay and I hope you have fun. <laughs> and a huge thanks to those who readily supported and encouraged me on this journey, on my booktube journey. It truly means the world to me. So if you would, please like this video and subscribe to my channel because it really does help me out and let me know what you guys want to see. And as always, I will see you guys in a new video. Cheers.